from VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship, this is Episode 6 of Circle of Willis, where I chat with social neuroscientist and demigod John Cassiopo about inferring causal associations between mind and body, and about how to be human is to care for others. Hey everyone, it's Jim Cohn. This is my podcast, Circle of Willis. In this episode, I'm chatting with John Cassiopo, who is, uh, ready for this? The Tiffany and Margaret Blake Distinguished Service Professor and the founder and director of the Center for Cognitive and Social Neuroscience, all at the University of Chicago. John is one of the founders of the whole field of social neuroscience. He's the author of more than 500 scientific articles, chapters, reviews, commentaries. This guy, he's authored or edited more than 20 books. He has, I just, I can't, I can't get through all of this. I can't do it. Listing all his awards and honorary things and advisory posts and board memberships. It would be just like reading one of those begat sections of the Bible that just drones on and on. Now, right away, I want to say um, there, was a, there was a big problem with recording this conversation. Not a big problem. There was, a pro- there was an issue, okay? For about the first seven minutes or so of our chat, my, re- my recording setup, the, the, well, the details, they don't really matter. The, 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 the good news is I caught it pretty quickly and uh, and all was basically okay, but I do feel there are certain moments, brief clips from those early minutes, that seven minutes that went awry, that went wrong, that I that I just can't live without. Uh, here's here's one example right right now. Uh, I've been reading John Cassiopo work in one form or another at least since 1990. 1991, somewhere around then. That's that's when I start uh, working with John Gottman in his lab. You know, we, we had the compulsory readings of of principles of psychophysiology. It was like it was like the Bible. You were you were like one of the prophets. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny that I mentioned the Bible right out of the gate. I, I sort of can't help but use religious metaphors when I talk about John Cassiopo. I even I thought I thought it would be kind of funny in the introduction to refer to him as a demigod because because he he sort of is for me or if he isn't a demigod then he then he really is like one of the the biblical prophets and that that early book of his that i mentioned uh principles of psychophysiology it's like my bible the 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 holy text of my of my scholarly origin story it's funny if all my metaphors for john cassiopo are religious John's metaphors for himself have mainly to do with childhood and play. He's always talking about how he never had to have a job, that he always loved brain teasers and puzzles as a kid, and, uh, and that brain teasers and puzzles are sort of what he continues to do in his work, which he doesn't even like to call work. And I, w- I want to say a little bit more about that in, in a moment, you know, sort of what counts as work, because I think it's, I think it's related to his background. Which, by the way, we didn't get too much into. Uh, I would, I would like to have gotten more into his background, but I did get a little bit. I got this, for example. Uh, my high school years were in St. Louis. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I was the first oh, in my family yes. to go to college, and so I went to the University of Missouri. My undergraduate degree was in economics. So, so but what did you? So, what did your, what did your folks do? Your folks were in St. Louis in they high were. school. Uh, my father was a businessman. He had a small business that he operated. My mother was uh, stayed at home with the kids. And uh, I had two older siblings who kind of went off and did their things. And, and uh, you know, I didn't want to go to work. So I went to school. I went to graduate Yeah, yeah I went to undergraduate work, work school. Work was crummy. I love that line. I didn't want to go to work, he says. He, he never says this directly, 
at any point during our conversation, but, but I suspect that part of the reason he doesn't characterize his own job uh, as involving real work is that he's a, he's a first-generation college student. It, it reminds me, actually, of, a, of the time my stepfather, Dwayne, asked me what I did to make money when I was in grad school. And I told him, you know, the sort of things that I did back then. And, uh, and he was quiet for a little while. He was sort of, there was this pause. He was trying to be respectful. And, and he said, uh, you know, as earnestly as he could manage, but uh, w- what do you do? He didn't even get that what I was describing was, was the work part. That was all like prelude. He was waiting for me to produce something, to, to make a thing, to do something for other people that was tangible. And I, and I wasn't. And so it didn't really it didn't really seem like work to my stepfather. And I wonder whether John Cassiopo, you know, because he's he's a kind of a first generation guy, he just it's never occurred to him that the that the stuff he does all through his adulthood is really work. You know, in 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 John Cassiopo's telling, he's just a he's sort of a big kid still, playing with his brain teasers and puzzles and, and having the time of his life. It doesn't feel like I've ever had a job. Really? It feels like, you know, I, as a kid, I liked brain teasers and puzzles, right? Yeah. And it seems like I'm still enjoying brain teasers and puzzles. Were you, were you... And in the meantime, he's generated a body of work that few scientists will ever match, or should even aspire to, really, if they value their health. I don't worry about John working too hard because he has this, he has this almost manic energy to him that feeds a kind of a voracious interest in how social life affects and is affected by the body. This interest is manifested in all kinds of ways. In the conversation that follows, we, we mainly talk about sort of the inferential minefield of mind-body associations. You know, sort of how and why the mind and brain affect and are affected by our physiology. John's contributions to research methodology in this area, and, and really what I would call uh, the, the philosophy of mind-body research are, are pretty hard to match. And he's always got a lot to say about it, and he says a lot here. But we also talk about his interest going on about 25 years now in, in the physiology and neuroscience of loneliness, an interest that has, has led him, in his own telling, to a really deep understanding of the, the human animal and an even deeper appreciation for the social world that he inhabits. Uh, I already mentioned how the first part of our conversation suffers from a recorder malfunction that renders it a little tough to listen to. It's it's not too big a deal. It's only about seven minutes or so, but it does mean that we do enter the conversation we're about to hear somewhat uh, midstream, you might say. So here's where we were. Uh, After schooling me a bit on the degree to which psychology was dismissive of biology throughout the 1960s and 70s, I asked John why so early in his career, when so few people were really doing it, he pursued a biological view of psychology. What specifically was the value of looking at the biology of human social life? And, uh, and here's what John Cassiopo had to say. We can change what you say. The value is not that I can describe it in biologic terms. The value is that those social factors are operating on the biology. They operate through the biology, but they also operate on the biology. You know, the, 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 yeah, the, right, the, right, the, the right. Doctrine of multilevel analysis, there's, there's more than one call, cause, right, for yep. many complex phenotypes. Yep. Uh, those causes, when you put them together, aren't always additive. So you have to understand both, for instance, genetic and environmental factors when you're dealing with gene-environment interactions or gene-environment correlations. Or, that, for that matter, some biologic non-genetic factor, and like arousal or, or uh, affective states, and, and a psychological or behavioral factor. And reciprocal determinism. And, uh, you know, yeah. think about natural selection operates on phenotypes, not genes. And so not too surprisingly, those phenotypic expressions can influence a number of now gene expression, but also just genetic selection or other biologic processes. And one of my favorite examples is uh, we know that testosterone in male rhesus monkeys predicts sexual advances. The public knows that. That's not a surprise to anyone. Yeah. But that 
line of research also showed that the testosterone in those male monkeys was a function of the availability of receptive females in the colony. So what's, what's really driving? Yeah, right, exactly. right, right. I know. God. And so, so it's not just reductionism. It's trying to understand the system as a whole. Yeah. That, so that yeah, was the yeah, approach yeah, we took. So that's what's calibrated for reductionism. See, it's going back. But, and but you're doing this in the. You're not thinking that yet, right? I mean, are you thinking along those lines? In when, when, when were you finishing up undergraduate school? When, when were you, we talking about? Seventy five, seventy three. So you're not thinking, are you, are you like reading Bateson or something? You're thinking, you know, systems. No. I mean, was, how, 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 is this just coming up no, whole I was, cloth? I was from, more likely to read a chemistry text than I was, you know, a philosopher at that point. But, but you know, you think about uh, emergent properties in chemistry. Yes. It's exactly the same thing. To understand covalent bonding, we, we couldn't just work at the atomic level. You had to work at the molecular level to define the properties of the atoms that permitted the specific kind of... Uh, yep. bonding that they saw between uh, atoms to give you certain kinds of molecules. Yep. And so that, that calibrated reductionism is going back and forth so that you can inform more completely how the elements are producing the whole. And often they are not just additive. That's, that's what's so magical about, in fact, how humans interact is that we have synergisms. We don't simply add people and add effects. Now, you look at economic analyses of productivity over the thousands of years before the Industrial Revolution, it was described in terms of additivity. The productivity of countries depended on the number of workers in the fields. That's the model of it, all right? Yeah. But if you actually think about what makes us special, it's the non-additivity. I'll give you a simple example. Okay. Let's say I'm moving furniture by myself. Yeah. I'm going to hurt my back, break the furniture, and scratch the floor. Yep. If you, I do it all the time. Right. Now, let's say that you and I are going to uh, work together to do it. Yeah. If we take the simple additive approach, we're both going to hurt our backs, break furniture, and scratch the floor. But we'll finish twice as fast. Right. But that's not what we do. That's not really how it works. Right. In fact, you get in the other side of the table. We carry the table. Neither one of us hurt our backs. Neither one of us break the furniture. Neither one of us scratch the floors. That's synergism. But, you know, when you go back 40 years, it's not that I could articulate it as completely then as yes. it's now. Right. And, and what I really was turned on by uh, when, you know, that professor said I know how to find out was, was that all of a sudden data held the answer. That, yeah. you know, I, I was good yeah. at arguing, which is why I was going to law school. Yeah. And, and what I could do is I could take a position, win an argument, turn around, take the other position, win the argument. And it proved <laughs> to me I knew nothing. That's what I proved. <laughs> Right. And I found that frustrating. And, you know, the, the, with with data, you know, it, it makes you humble. Yeah. And with that humility, you can then learn tons. Now, now you have to follow certain procedures. Right. Yeah. You know, philosophy of science, methodology of science are incredibly important to follow and adhere to. And there's ways to do it that get you. I kind of think about it as a turtle and the, and the hair race. Right. Yeah. If you take shortcuts. A program of research, efficacy. I, I've got nature. I'll never know the true form of nature, right? Right. But science gives me a chance to probe and become closer to it. And so I might have a hypothesis. Now, I'm not divine, so that hypothesis is not going to be accurate. It may be close, but that's one doesn't know. Yeah. By the scientific method, if I do everything right, yeah. don't take shortcuts, don't worry about instrumentality, don't worry about tenure, I just do the right thing then the likelihood that I'm going to be accurate, that what I have reporting is reproducible and replicable, then the next thing I do, the next thing I do, the next thing I do should be getting me closer. Yeah. And the accuracy of that fifth, sixth hypothesis in a program of research is the joint probability of the accuracy of all the preceding, <laughs> right? Yeah, now, what yeah, if, yeah. What if I'm taking shortcuts? Now that might be 0.8. Instead of 0.99, is 0.8 and 0.8 and 0.8. Well, you go out 0.8 to the fifth, you're not dealing with very high likelihood. So you're actually moving away from truth, not toward truth. Not that oh, I'll yeah. ever know when I get there, but just in concept, conceptually, I'm getting closer. And so I can do programs of research. Other people can come along and are likely to be able to see roughly the same thing. And now the literature starts to inform me in a more important way. The other thing I know about the literature that I, you know, I find students often don't appreciate is that this is like having an army of RAs who have already gone out there and asked relevant questions. Yeah. But that means what is relevant is the methods and the results, not what the scientists say about it. What are the methods and results? I may have a completely different take on what they're doing than the questions they asked. And yeah. so what's really relevant are 
what was the study? What did the data? And then, you know, their interpretations become relevant, but that's, that's secondary. It's really, what are the data? That's what, it's like having an RA, you came in and say, here's what it means, Professor Cohn, and go, well, let me look at the data because I'm not sure, sh- we'll, we'll determine what it means. Right, that let's, might let's, be. Figure it, let's figure it out. That's right. That's a likely story. It's an interesting story, but we need to know how it maps. Right, and, and the fact that you can come up with a story that's consistent with data just means you're clever. It doesn't mean you're right. Yeah. I mean, if in fact we can never know absolute truth, only proximal truth through science, then that means that I should be able to come up with more than one story. It's just, it's a test of my intellectual cleverness as to how many plausible stories I can come up with. And the more I can come up with, the more exciting it is to look at the next set of data. The other thing that this suggests is you never design a study that has to come out a certain way. It's not worth doing. You because never design a study that has to come out a certain way. Right, got it. To yeah. be a quote, because interpretable or useful because you're not learning anything. And it's, if you're going to use proximal truth, each study has to be probative. It has to give you some useful information to get closer, even by saying, hey, I was wrong before. That'll yeah. get you closer. Now, let me, let me push back a little bit, because I, mean, I, I wonder if there's another axis. I mean, you sort of brought it up, and I don't think you, you, you're really devaluing it, but there, you said everything has to be probative. But you look at you know, Festinger's early work, yeah. you know, uh, you know, Schachter and Singer, these are not particularly probative studies, but hugely influential studies. So I wonder about the, the effect of, you know, like the heuristic value of some of these studies when, when the data and the methods are really quite flawed. We're at a different point in science in our field than we were, you know, 80 years ago, Interesting. 60 okay. years ago. And, and that's because at that point in time, in the middle of the 20th century, when these individuals were proposing these new theories, they were looking at particular single causes. They were looking at small questions. I mean, they, they were big in a field, but you know, no one outside of social actually cared what they found. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that was okay because people were differentiating, they were specializing, methods were being developed, new frameworks for thinking about phenomena within that field of inquiry was yeah. being developed. And there were a lot of things that were being overlooked. I mean, uh, Occam's razor applied. Keep it simple. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they did. Yeah, if yeah, you remember sure in Schachter's study, it was supposed to be about physiological arousal. Yeah. Well, Valens came along shortly after and took a microphone and did this, right? <laughs> and simulated a heart rate, simulated speeding it up, and that was found to produce the same effects from which they concluded the physiology is irrelevant. May yeah. I point out that's not a logical interpretation. <laughs> no, it's not, it right? doesn't It follow. means that the belief <laughs> is sufficient, not yeah. that it's yeah, sufficient yeah. and necessary. Yeah, 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 right. right. <laughs> and so, so, you know, people did simple thinking, not, not the most sophisticated thinking, but it was understandable because they were all working in what then were very complicated, uncharted territory. We're in the 21st century. Yeah. And we now can stand on their shoulders and look out, and we see that our field is one of many fields of yeah. inquiry that's relevant. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. where the social and bio was, right? You can see that many of these fields are relevant. So how do we bring them together to ask bigger questions? And now Occam's razor doesn't work because it's not about keep it simple because, you know, you find an effect and you say, what else can produce it? Yeah. That's not what we, you know, as S. Stevens handbook said, when you find an effect, the next question on the part of a scientist is natural, whether you're a physicist or a psychologist, you ask, how general is it? Yeah. And that's not what one should ask. One should say, what else is producing that effect so that I can better understand the outcome that I'm trying to actually model, right? And because if I ask about generality, I might have a replicable effect, but no one else will be able to find it. And so it looks like your effect isn't replicable. There's a, so there's reproducibility. If you look at my data, do you get what I get? If yeah. you analyze my data, do we get the same things? Yeah. And there, you know, openness, public sharing of data is critical. Yeah. The second is replicability. If I do a study and you do the same study, do we get the same thing? Yes, yes, yes. The third is generalizability. And may I point out, if I have multiple determined phenomena, if biologic and social and multiple social factors are operating, you're going to have issues of generalizability. Yeah, the question there's going to be moderators and on and on and goes. Right. What are, the, what are the factors operating and under what conditions do these different processes operate? That becomes a relevant question. So it's not a methodological problem. It's a theoretical question. Let me just give you a very simple example. Please. <laughs> so, so we use brain imaging, right? Yeah. And the assumption is that activation of an area means that area is involved, and the failure to activate an area means it's not involved. Yeah. So let's say that uh, it's maybe early March, all right? Is it warm in Virginia in early March? 
It can be. Okay, so let's say it's early March. Yeah. It isn't warm in Chicago. <laughs> no. No. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a, a new imaging procedure and, and a contrast methodology to study something that you really, it's hard to put your fingers into and grab, right? I'm going to look at temperature a, as a function of, of time of day, 6 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to use thermal imaging. Yeah, and yeah. I'm going to take the two images, I'm going to subtract them, and lo and behold, I find the material basis of, of temperature, it's my radiator. Yeah, yeah. That's involved, Makes right? Makes sense. But of right? course, I look and I say, well, my LED on the thermostat is also the basis of temperature. The point is that just because it's active, just because you see something doesn't mean it's actually contributory or irrelevant. Now, you, seeing that, immediately replicate the study, all right? And so you do exactly the same study in Virginia at 6 and 10 in the, in the morning. You subtract the two images, and your radiator and LED are not illuminated at all. Uh, but your right. curtains yeah, yeah. are blazing. Yeah. So yeah. curtains are the material base. Because <laughs> <laughs> the sun is being... Yeah, right. So I mean, oh, geez. Yeah, it gets, okay. it gets very complicated very quickly. Right. So I need to know what the sources are and then the processes and then the conditions the under which... Conditions. It, and that's not a methodological problem. That's not a statistical problem. That's a theoretical problem. See, that is a really... That's just a, such a great take on theory and theorizing. Because theorizing it has been... Uh, popularly understood as storytelling. You think about it. You've, you've, it follows. This follows logically from the notion that I have multiply determined non-additive processes yeah. or outcomes, right? Yeah. So, and, and social phenomena are complicated. If yeah. I have a very simple cognitive mechanism, there may be one determinant. It's perception. In many cases, they are kind yeah. of s- simply determined. But as you move along, we know this about the brain, as you move forward, you get more and more integrative, more and more complicated, more and more malleable organizations. If I look at the spinal cord, it's a pretty simple organism. Yeah. As I move up that spinal cord, the neural axis, the neural behavioral axes are differentially controlled, right? Yeah. All of a sudden you have uh, no more uh, stimulus flexi- uh, inflexibility. It's not a stereotype. So I have uh, different antecedents that can operate. I have contextual control and I have behavioral flexibility. If I reach out and touch a burning wall, I immediately withdraw my hand. Right? That's yeah. a spinal cord reflex. Yeah. Yeah. But if your child is standing across that wall that's on fire, you can force yourself yeah. to go through that pain. Yeah. But you don't immediately. You look and say, you know, there's a door here that's not on fire. I'm going <laughs> to go through that. Maybe I'll do that instead. The spinal cord can't <laughs> do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right? So that kind of flexibility also means I'm going to have multiple determinism. If I know that structure, then logically what I just said follows Occam's razor can be misleading because I'm going to, I'm going to say, look, the bulk of the studies, because the bulk of the studies I did are only showing this antecedent. So your antecedent doesn't win in a meta-analysis. Yeah. You're going, well, that's simply a function of the literature that you happen, or it may exist. So it's, it's about theoretical sophistication. So instead of Occam's razor, we use Einstein's razor. The notion is keep it simple, but not too simple. Not, not, yeah, no simpler than it has to be. Then no right? simpler than it has to be. Yeah. But yeah. The, you know, but I think people fear complexity. There's a there's a good thing to keep in mind. Yeah. When we were all kids, we liked brain teasers. We liked puzzles. Yeah. Right. And we're just dealing with bigger and more complicated, but just as appealing of puzzles. I love puzzles. And and <laughs> you know, if you remember, there are certain rules you use. In making those puzzles. So yeah. take a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. You don't randomly start putting together pieces because it'll take you forever to put the puzzle together, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You find the four corners. Yeah. yeah that's right. Once you find the four corners, you find the edges. The edges. Sure. Once you find the edges. Colors. Or you right. Mean, yeah. Right. You, there's a certain process and it works across all jigsaw puzzles. Yeah. So when you have these complicated problems, like we're talking about, the, the, lot, the, the, the epistemology we just talked, discussed, it's like finding the edges. It's like finding the corners, then find the edges. If you know that, you don't try to reject other antecedents. You try to understand under what conditions. You say, I don't know whether this is replicable or whether this is a problem of replicability or a problem of generalizability, but both are possible. So I'm gonna, I want to just shift, shift gears just a little bit because I don't want to miss this, you know, since I've got you here, right? Uh, you know, I, I definitely think of you as this great methodologist in sort of a, a, a theorist of theory within psychophysiology. Well, I used to call myself, by the way, a social psychophysiologist right. and now it's right. social neuroscientist. Great. But uh, when I think of you 
from a content perspective, I think of you as having multiple you know, moments of, of content that are the focus as you move through applying these, these inferential theoretical principles right. in ways that, that, that have an influence in a lot of different ways. But then this emerging content area comes of sort of social relationships, loneliness. Where does that come from? So I always wanted to put the social and bio together. Right? Yeah. And I, I thought, you know, there's a lot of correlative work. Uh-huh. Right? It's about some broad process like marital status yeah. and Health disease. Or disease. Or, yeah. or and you're going, longevity. well, what's the mechanism? What are the transduction yeah. pathways? Yeah. No, it's, this is an epidemiology study. We don't ask that. You yeah. go, well, how do you know it's causal? Yeah. Right? How do you know that this, you know, if I eat broccoli, does it really stop cancer? Or is it that people who eat broccoli are also wealthier and they're more likely yeah. to have yeah. good medical... I mean, or for that who matter, knows if I it. smoke a cigarette, does it really cause cancer? Right. I mean, that was, the, that was the pushback for the, the, the cigarette companies were saying all this time, well, what's right. the mechanism? You don't know whether this is At causal. At least they had animal studies. There. They bothered yeah. to do relevant Eventually. animal studies. Yeah. Right. right, right. But so I thought, you know, to me, it's really important to be able to say, specify mechanism. And... Mm. Uh, the the, uh, the assumption all along, of course, is that the brain is the transduction. That's the engine that's actually moderating our social relationships. It's moderating what contextual rules are operating, gives me the behavioral flexibility, and the stimulus control is more flexible because it's symbolic as well yeah. as physical. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, you know, all of a sudden the t- attention gets pointed to the, to the brain. And, you know, the whole approach is what are the neural, hormonal, cellular, and genomic processes by that underlie and and implement uh, these superorganismal structures and processes that define social species, and so to address that question, it required I change the kind of research I was doing. To, to, yeah. to you know, I, it's not enough to lay out the question. If you really want to kind of make the point, get a productive line of research showing there's an answer. And so uh, I took a, a, a traditional neuroscience approach. If I want to know what a gene does, I create a knockout mouse, right? Yeah. And I compare the neural or behavioral processes I see between that normal mouse and the knockout mouse. Yeah. I'm not actually interested in the absence of the gene, but by having that focus, I can figure out what that gene is doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when, you know, studies of Phineas Gage before and after the tamping iron obliterated his orbital frontal cortex were informative, not because the hole in the head did anything, but because the changes in behavior told us what filled that hole before the accident, uh-huh. right? It's a uh-huh. method of deletion. And so if I want to study how these social connections and stable social connections are one of the defining features of, in biology of a social species then I can look at people without those. And there's two ways to define the absence. One is objective, one is perceived. Well, if the brain is the transduction mechanism for these processes, perceived is where the money's going to be. Yeah. Now, epidemiologists have been studying objective since 1979, yeah. and it already identified that as important. And the reason their model was it was health behaviors. Yeah. I didn't need right, to right, go right. inside the body. There's right. nothing biology yeah. relevant, right? right. And, of course, there, and it really was really health behaviors because somebody's telling me to do a thing. Someone's yes, telling yes. me to go to the doctor. Someone's telling, reminding me to take, take pills. That's right. It's called the social control yeah. hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we started studying objective and perceived social isolation. And, and you know, it didn't take it's long beautiful. for someone to point out that perceived social isolation is called loneliness. You're yeah, studying loneliness. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And honestly... I almost stopped studying it at that point because I didn't really want to be a loneliness researcher. Yeah. I mean, at that point, loneliness... Such a mundane construct from a certain perspective. Absolutely, and it wasn't very important. It was kind of this trivial personality characteristic, and it had been studied by, you know, personality theorists in the 80s, and it was kind of no longer of interest. And I, I, you know, I wasn't particularly interested in that. But I thought, you know what? The scientific value of this... I mean, the logic is there, so just stick with it. And I, I, I... like to work on areas until I, I'm starting to make marginal contributions. <clears throat> kind of the remarkable thing to me was loneliness turned out to be much more important than we thought. It's like fish in water. We don't understand its impact on our brain, on our neuroendocrine system, on our cellular functioning, or for that matter, on, on gene expression. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's incredibly uh, uh, wide in kind of the, the areas in Korea it has pushed us. Uh, we've learned new social processes like contagion of loneliness, this new, uh, new molecular mechanisms underlying uh, some of those effects. 
And so it, I keep kind of discovering new things that keep me in this field. I never thought I'd study something for 20 years. Well, you find a thing that bears fruit, right? Not only uh, r- results that are interpretable, valid, yeah. reliable, but also that are valuable. Well, see, I get bored. So, I mean, with the, with the elaboration likelihood model, that was a, that was a research engine. I mean, yeah. we were just making, you know, JPSP yeah, after yeah, JPSP yeah. because it was making accurate <clears throat> predictions that surprised people. But, and uh-huh. Rich, Rich still does work in that area and continues to surprise me by really flesh kind it of the brilliance yeah, yeah, of, yeah. yeah. But I became bored. I, I just, it wasn't that interesting any longer because most of it had been laid out and these were interesting and important, but I just... I wanted to go do something else. Yeah, yeah. I, I continue to study loneliness because it continued to surprise me. So, you know, we had this PNAS that came yeah. out. You know, Steve Cole, John Capitanio. Yeah, uh, when was Steph that? My, that was that was 2007? Or no, no, no. Oh, this is the recent, the most, most recent, recent one. one. I, I think about the, the gene expression one from like about 10 years ago. Yeah, there was one in 2007, there was one in 2010, yeah, that's right. yeah, and then yeah. this one had longitudinal data from yes. humans, yeah. so we could say, in fact, it was causal, and yep. in fact, it was reciprocally causal, <laughs> um, and then we replicated in monkeys, yeah. and we also, dem- you know, you can get these immunologic and genomic changes, Jeez. but are the gene expression variations in these tweaks of immunology of any real importance? So we infected the monkeys with the virus, and in fact, they got sicker. The yeah. lonely monkeys yeah. got sicker. Yeah. So, so, you know, a lot of, like, the ratio of CD4 to CD8 cells that you see as a result of mental arithmetic probably have no real immunologic importance. Yeah. But, when you know, a, a vaccine challenge or a viral challenge is how you can test whether there is something of immunologic importance. And so that's what we did, and we found it to be to actually contribute to that. And so why? So your natural selection is going to operate on processes that promote survival, reproduction, and a genetic legacy. Now, I've added that third, and here's why. If I'm studying insects, as most geneticists have done, because, you know, if I study (laughs) humans, I'm never going to get my dissertation done. I have to have multiple generations to do, right? So fruit flies are great because I can do my dissertation in no time. You can actually study fitness, right? right? Can't do that in humans. Now, uh, for a fruit fly, their genetic legacy depends on how many fruit flies they spawn, right? Yeah. But humans aren't like that. Mammals generally are not like that because let's say that uh, we live in conditions of privation. Uh, And let's say that I'm the economist. I'm concerned. I'm the invertebrate, right? I'm concerned about only my short-term interests, and it's all about me. Yeah. You are a homo sapien, the wise one rather than the rational one. For whatever (laughs) reason, you have this mutation where you form connections and bonds and caring and empathy with others, all yeah. right? Now, but we're both in these very difficult conditions of privation. So I may well survive longer than you. I may spawn more offspring because I have no compunction. <laughs> I'm, I'm the consummate psychopath out there, right? Yeah. I'm only concerned about me. I don't share food. I don't share defense. And those offspring that are left uncared for, unprotected, unfed, all perish. Yeah. This is a one generation elimination of that type of gene yeah, yeah, if there's yeah. no one else kind of caretaking. But you can see, so we have others taking care, but not at the same rate as if you're the one doing the defense, you're the one feeding, right. you're the one sharing food. Right. So that, your genetic legacy, even though you had fewer offspring, is actually going to exceed the homo economicus walking around. And so that's why I say survival, reproduction, but those are not sufficient in mammals because we have offspring who are born dependent. Humans, the longest period of dependency, given the age span, yeah, the yeah, yeah. lifespan. And so one has to also have these biological carrots and sticks that make us care, that form these connections. And, and in biology, social species are defined as conspecifics who interact sufficiently frequently that they form recognizable bonds, units. societies, yeah, units. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. And so those connections become a defining feature is why I also studied the absence of them. So what the evolutionary theory that we posited says that um, when, and it's not just humans, it's phylogenetically so deep, we're unaware that we do this. <laughs> but when you feel isolated, and you can feel isolated when you're around others, that sure. means I don't know who's friend or foe. Sure, sure, you know, sure. A soldier on the streets of Kabul may be in the middle of the a busy of streets of Kabul. That doesn't mean they feel connected. Because you don't know who you can 
depend on you can and, and, and we, we think of it as outsourced to you know you don't right. know who you can you can let someone else take this cognitive that's right biological right. operation on instead of me doing it myself well you don't have mutual aid and protection as simple as that yeah you don't yeah have mutual, mutual aid and protection pers- without yeah. mutual aid and protection i've lost one of the real benefits of my species yeah. so so what I'm, I'm for whether i'm with the others or not i'm now on the social perimeter yeah. And it's not only we feel sad, we feel like it makes us want to connect. And that's one of the purposes of it. But there's these seemingly paradoxical effects as well. And it is that you become hyper surveillant implicitly yep. of social threats. Yeah. Yeah. And you become focused on yourself. Now, again, other social animals besides humans you can see behavioral evidence of this same self-preservation. It promotes short-term self-preservation. All the physiological changes, all the metabolic changes, all the hormonal changes, and for that matter, the neural changes, we see in service of that endpoint. But because there, so we have this. Uh, so it's initially like it's getting it's it's serving a function that's 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 hopefully reparative, that's, right? That's so it's well. Th- the part about this surveillance and preparation for attack is not to repair those connections. It's to keep you alive long enough. Oh, right. Okay, right? so just it's self-reliance. Right. Now, there is also these reparative mechanisms, but many of the behavioral and physiological effects are working against that. Ah. But if I'm not, you know, if I think you might be a friend and I'm wrong, then, then I'm hosed. that's a one-time yeah. error. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. get to try again. Right. So it's probably better that I try to make you a friend, but I do it. After standing back from after you. running you through some tests, that's right. And, yeah, and you know, it, yeah. I, I often think I, I often think that the most dangerous thing for a person is not actually to be alone. It's to it's to believe you're not alone when you are. <laughs> it's like to be out. Let's think about it as vigilance. You know, you're out. You're out. In, you're in, you're in scary territory, da- right. dangerous territory, and you believe that so and so is watching out for you a little bit. So you right. relax that's your vigilance a little bit and root around for some berries on the ground. I mean, then you get eaten because they they didn't give a shit about you. They're just so that there has to be some kind of protective. That's mechanism. exactly right. And so the notion is your brain goes into self-preservation mode. And you know, in in the annual review paper last year, we outlined a neurobiological model for this, and it is the prefrontal. Is uh-huh. making that comparison of, of friend foe and like I, lateral, do I have mutual yeah. do I have mutual aid and protection or not? It links to the uh, bed nucleus of the striatum analysis. Sure. You know, the amygdala is responsible for short term yeah, and changes. Yeah. The bed nucleus is contextually driven. If I'm in a dangerous circumstance, I don't have anything to respond to yet. Uh-huh. But I need to be ready to respond. Yeah. And so we actually think it's the bed nucleus <laughs> who's great. feeding back to the paraventricular nucleus and down the yeah, sympathetics. Yeah. And so actually makes sense. raising all of these and uh, adjusting cellular functioning like the release of myeloma tissue from the bone marrow earlier, which produces different epigenetic expressions, which yeah. is producing, you know, cortical uh, steroid resistance over time and, uh, you know, organismal inflammation, uh, changes from viral defenses to bacterial defenses. In an evolutionary world, these changes actually make sense. Make perfect sense. In contemporary This is your body. World, this is what I meant by your body sort of rebudgeting. Your brain right. is rebudgeting. That's it's like, right. whoa, this is not a good investment. Let's invest this way. But there are cognitive effects. But there's effects. always trade-offs. Right. There are cognitive effects. There are behavioral effects that in evolutionary time have a great adaptive value. Yeah. But in contemporary society are coming to work against us. And so one of the features, it promotes social withdrawal for the very reason you said, because if I go jumping out at people and approaching everybody, I'm going to get my head handed to me. Yeah, yeah. And so those processes make it easy to withdraw behind uh, 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 Facebook. Yeah. And so, oh, right. Well, I was just going to ask you, speaking of contemporary society, where are we headed? Where so, are we headed? You know, uh, Facebook, social media uh, is a tool, just like a car. If I use a car... And I drive around and I see my friends at parties and families Uh and I wave to them and drive by, I'm going to feel lonelier. Yeah, yeah, But it's not going to solve that, right? Uh, If I use it to drive to the party, get out of the car, and meet people face-to-face and then have enjoyable commerce, then then that's going to lower loneliness. So when it's used as a destination, when Facebook or similar social media uh, outlets are used as a destination, they tend to be associated with higher loneliness or higher depression. Yeah. When it's used as a way station, like internet dating is... Right. That's yeah. using or yeah, yeah, some yeah. kids or use, Tinder even something right. like that. You know, these, these then it's likely to lower because it's promoting 
new interactions with potential uh, new friends. Which are the interactions that our body is designed to, to have. Right. And I, and I keep grounding it for myself. I have to keep grounding it in the body because, because you know, brains are not little solipsistic, That's right. you know, devices just doing the thing for themselves. They're, they're body moving machines, they're, you right. know, and we have all kinds of stuff that we need to do and feel and sense. Yeah. But let me go back. You, you know, this notion of mutilating protection, it, it underscores a particular thing about how, what it means to have a new and quality relationship. And that is, it's not about interacting with them. So I get things. It no, is the mutuality, that's right. the it's reciprocity. The mutuality. It's the communal, that's you know, right. the joining, the linking, the sharing goals. And the synergisms that yes. come from that. Yeah. So if yeah. I'm out there just getting things, it doesn't solve loneliness. And right. think about it. If it did, people in hospitals wouldn't be lonely because they, they press a button and the nurse is there. Right. 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 And right. she'll or he will bring whatever resources. I'll sit and talk to you. Yeah. You know, but that doesn't, that's not the relationship that really no, provides you. You need to life. have that. Here. So right. it's so and absolutely So it's about being able to give and take, not just take. Remember okay. Scully Scullenberger? Yeah. Who brought down that, the, the, that the very airplane. big plane yeah. full of passengers, and he brought it down on the Hudson River yeah. safely. Yeah. Okay. That was not something humans are designed to do. No. But he had been an F-4 pilot. He You're had right. done 20 years of commercial pilot. He was not only a glider pilot, he was a glider pilot trainer. Uh-huh. Right? So, so he there was, was he ever someone who's training. He had overlearned it. That's right. He yeah. was the perfect person yeah. to be in that situation. Yeah. So he was a lot of the hero. Yeah. But what went unnoticed was he was not sufficient for those passengers and crew to survive. Within three to four minutes, commercial boat captains were on the scene. People were coordinating. Came, and they were the first ones there. Yeah. And they were also necessary for that passenger and crew because it was the winter, right? Uh-huh. They, they were in the middle of the Hudson River. I don't know how many would have successfully swum to shore. And they saved those. And they, they violated their commercial interests by taking the time to go save these passengers. Yeah. And none of them were lauded heroes because that's what we do as a species. So we overlooked it. We didn't notice it. Yeah. So we need systematic studies of what the mind is doing, not a phenomenological approach, to actually tell the public and to, tell, you know, uh, to learn for ourselves how can one best negotiator solve the problems that we're facing in society, including how do we live a long, healthy life that's productive not only for ourselves but for the next generation and, because and, we care about that. And do you think that we have sufficient knowledge so far from your work and others that – to, to say things like, I mean, I told people like Barbara, Barbara Haggerty, who we both talked to, that sometimes I feel like there ought to be, you know, a public health service announcements, right? Public health announcements like, you know, we all know that we're supposed to follow the food pyramid. We yeah. all know that we're supposed to, to, to exercise. And exercising is an investment. We don't want to exercise, right? Yeah. You know, until it becomes a lifestyle. Right. Um, but we don't think about structure and maintenance an investment in our social world. That's just supposed to happen. Like the, like the right. people helping Sully, uh, you know, get the people off the plane. That's, right. That's just supposed to be the thing that happens. So I think here's what we do know. We know enough to know that the model of humans as homo economicus isn't the right one. Mm-hmm. And so public policies that we implement with that alone in mind, uh, they're inefficient because they're not actually capitalizing on our very nature. All right. Well, John, thank you so much. This was, this was phenomenal. Really appreciate your time. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's it. Thanks to Mr. John Cassiopo for giving it his all, as usual, as is his want. He doesn't, John Cassiopo doesn't do anything half heartedly. After that conversation, I was, I was sort of exhausted, in a good way, of course. And uh, and before I left his lab, he took me on a little tour. The place is amazing, and uh, and I want to thank him for that too. Anyway, look for some bonus John Cassiopo material in the next few days. And uh, and remember that the music on Circle of Willis is written by Tom Stopher and Gene Ruley and performed by their band. The New Drakes. For information about how to purchase their music, check out the About page at circleofwillispodcast.com. Don't forget also that Circle of Willis is brought to you by VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. 
and that Circle of Willis is a member of the Tej FM network. You can find out more about that at tej.fm. Now, uh, folks, if you like this podcast, how about giving us a little review at iTunes and letting us know how we're doing? It's really easy, and we like it. I want you to do that for us, if you can. Or, or just send us an email by going to circleofwillispodcast.com and clicking on the Contact tab. In any case, I'll see you all at Episode 7, where I talk with neuroscientist Marco Iacoboni. I love saying that name, Iacoboni. It's, it's fun for me. Uh, anyway, he's of the University of California at Los Angeles, otherwise known as UCLA. Until then, bye-bye. Where in this hell can see